grade three fours welcome back to science at my house this week uh, i decided that we're just going to keep learning the topic we were going to be doing at school anyway because it's an easy one to do in your homes and that is the topic of forces and when we talk about forces there's probably two main groups that i want you to learn about the first group are ones that work by contact so when two things touch each other so at the moment I'm pushing down on this chair because I'm sitting on it, I can touch that or I can pull something. Or when two things rub against each other, that causes friction. So those are contact forces. Um, also buoyancy, where water pushes up on things to make it float. And then you've got other forces that can actually act from a distance, like magnets, magnetism, and gravity, and things that can work without anything touching anything. So I thought I'd start today by telling you about a man called Isaac Newton who came up with three laws of how things move and the forces that act on things to make them move or help them move. Now these sound really complicated when you first hear them so what we're going to do is I'm going to put each law up in a photograph and then I'm just going to tell you in like baby language what it means because some of them are actually pretty easy to understand. All right so here's the first one now. All right, Newton's first law of motion says that an object at rest will stay at rest or an object in motion will stay in motion unless a force acts upon it. So let me put this in baby terms. Are you ready? Um, a mouse sitting on a desk won't move unless you put a force on it. Easy. And something rolling along the ground like a marble won't stop rolling unless you put a force on it. So if something's still, it won't move. If something's rolling, it won't stop unless a force acts on it. It's pretty easy. I think you're going to be able to do that one. Now it's kind of obvious, right? Because, you know, imagine if that didn't happen and you put your book down on the table one night and then the next morning you find it over next to the bedside table in your sister's room. Or, you know, you put down your drink bottle and then it magically appears next to the computer, which happens to mine all the time, but that's because someone has actually moved it. But it can't do it by itself. That's the first law of motion. The second law is this. Now this one looks really complicated because it's a formula and it looks like a maths formula and a confusing one at that. And it says force equals mass times acceleration. All right, you ready for the baby language? It means this. Heavier objects need more force to get them moving. Like if you want to get them going fast and get faster and faster, speed them up, you're going to have to push them harder. That kind of makes sense, right? Easy. And the third law of motion is this. Now this one's a little bit harder to put into baby words for you. But I can show you with an experiment, so that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, I'm very lucky today because my daughter has agreed to help with this experiment. So I uh, hope you enjoy Get all your bits and pieces together first, and then you can try this yourselves afterwards. All right, see you later. Hey, hello, everyone. This is Abby. Hi, everyone. Hi, Abby. That was the kids saying hello back to you. Okay, Abby's going to help us today. Uh, as you know, we're studying forces and we're looking at Newton's third law of motion, which is uh, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So I decided to teach that to you today by doing balloon rockets, which is something you like to do, yeah. something I like to do. Fun. Yeah, you did it. Yeah, they make lots of amusing sounds all the time. Yes, yes, you get lots <laughs> of fart sounds out of balloons. <laughs> okay, so what you're going to need is, Abby, can you hold these things for me? Some string. String, check. Straw, check. Some sticky tape, check. <laughs> oh, nearly dropped them in the garden. Okay. Scissors, check. Thank you. What else do we need from here? A balloon. Ah, a balloon. Really Chairs. <laughs> no, okay, don't help me. Alright, so you need two chairs, one at each end like this, and the balloon is going to go from one end to the other end, so you have to have a string tied between the two chairs. So Abby, if you could tie that up, and I'll show you them next week, thank you. So, hopefully you've got some plastic straws in your house. I have not been using plastic straws for a long time now, but I found these in my little craft cupboard, luckily. 
if you don't have one, don't worry, you can get a piece of paper and you can roll it up in a little um, cylinder around a pencil or something and give it some sticky tape and it'll hold together like a straw. So that should work just fine. All right, you cut the end off it that has that little, you know, expandable bit, cut that off. And this is what your balloon will be attached to on the string. So this then, have you tied that on? Yeah. Abby's tied the other end on. This has to now go onto that string. So pop that through. Now, in the meantime, just get your mum to do that. <laughs> and uh, get a balloon. And you probably want to stretch it a bit and blow it up a few times just to, you know, get it elastic, a bit elastic <laughs> Look at that. Did you see how well I blew up that balloon? That's beautiful. Yeah. Sorry, I can't get this through. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, once you've got this straw on the string, then you're going to tie the other end of the string onto the other chair, and it has to be tight. So you can tie it, and if it's a bit loose, you can pull the chairs apart. Don't break the string, but pull them apart a little bit so that um, you can see that it's nice and tight for this activity. Alright, thank you. Ready? Yep. Can you hold my balloon? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I've got some more. I thought that was the most elastic one. Yeah, I'll do that one. Can you go get the other one out of the garden? <laughs> no, I was kidding. I was kidding, you don't really have to do that. <laughs> okay. So your string should look something like this, nice and tight with a straw on the middle of it, and you take the straw all the way to this end. Now, Jeremy. No, I can't. <laughs> what that? You know we all love the sound of balloons, right? Okay, blow it up for us, Abs. You're probably actually going to need two people to do this. So you might want to see if, if you've got a brother or sister that can help you. That would be great. Or mum, dad's probably sitting around not doing anything, so ask him. <laughs> it's also great when you've got like colour coordinated. Got oh yeah. Straw. You've got a blue string though. Wrong colour. <laughs> Okay, then I want you to get two pieces of sticky tape and I want you to stick the balloon onto the straw in two places. So, there's the first one. Uh, I've got another one. I'm trying to have a sticky tape. Uh oh, it's alright, I've got this piece. Can you help me with this, please? Because I'm having some issues. Okay, there we go. So, when the air comes out of this balloon, it's going to go, the air's going to go out this way. It's the only way it can come out that way, and that is the action that's happening in this rocket. And You're then the re air out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> when an action happens, we get an equal and opposite reaction. So, so this balloon should go flying that way. That's how rockets work. That's how spaceships get into space. It kind of just makes sense, right? Did you know that? That that's how rockets got into yes, space. Are you sure? <laughs> okay, good. All right, come over here like this. You hold it here. Abby's gonna catch it at the other end. <laughs> you don't really need to. That's all right. Okay. You ready? I'm here for moral support for the balloon. Oh, thanks. Okay, you ready? Count me in. Three, two, one. Wait, wait, you've got to count down from ten. It's like a rocket. Oh, it's a good way to do Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Hey! And that's how it works, Abby. What a team. Okay, thank you. So after this, I'll show you how I want you to turn this kind of toy game thing into an actual experiment. Bye. Good away. <laughs> Bye. Okay. So any kid can make a balloon rocket, right? But not every kid could turn this into a science experiment. And this is what the difference is between just playing with things and then working things out. So I'm going to ask you to do this week is make a balloon rocket first of all, play around with it a little bit till you get familiar. But then I want you to turn this into some kind of scientific test. So if I asked you a question like this, uh, does the length of the straw make any difference to how fast the rocket goes? Could you come up with a way to test that? Or if I said to you, uh, does using a small balloon make the rocket go faster than using a big balloon? Could you think of an experiment for that? If I asked you something about what if I put just half the air into this balloon, didn't blow it up as big, would that make a difference to how far or how fast the rocket goes? The other thing that you could do an experiment on is on the type of string. What if I used a different type of string or if I didn't make it so tight, if I made it a bit looser, would that make a difference to how far or how fast 
the rocket goes. There are so many questions that you can come up with with any activity that you do around your house. So that's your activity for this week, your challenge. Go make up a science experiment. Tell me what your good question is and how you tested it and what you found out. All right, I'll see you soon. Bye. Now, a few of you asked me to see science in Legoland. I actually created it with my daughter, more for kind of the younger students, but why not? Here you go. Uh, here's science in Legoland for your entertainment. Bye. Once upon a time, in a faraway land made of Lego, lived two minifigures. One was called Danielle. I'm called Danielle. And the other was Sunny. I'm Sunny. It was almost lunchtime, and Sunny was working up an appetite, cooking a chicken drumstick on an open fire. He hummed merrily to himself. Danielle was trying to be a hardcore fisherman, catching fish with her bare hands. Why do they keep slipping out of my hands? It's almost like they don't want to be caught. Hey, would you like a drink of lemonade, Danielle? No thanks. How about water? I've got cold water in the fridge. No thanks, I'm good. Juice? I've got apple, orange, or apple with orange. Sunny, I don't want a drink, okay? Okay. Not even a milkshake? Danielle had given up fishing and was now eating a leaf off a nearby bush. What are you eating? Herbs. I'm trying to find the perfect herb for our chicken drumstick. No! I can't believe I forgot the secret herbs and spices! Do you want to go explore deep in the dark, scary forest for the perfect secret herbs and spices? It was quickly decided that this was indeed a good plan and the two set off on their quest to find the perfect secret herbs and spices for their chicken drumstick. Sunny found a herb straight away. I found one! Over here! Come and have a look, Danielle! Come and look! It's green and slimy, but it looks delicious. Sunny, that's gillyweed! I don't think that would go with chicken. Whoa, they have gillyweed in Australia? They continued on their journey. Hey Danielle, this plant's got anger issues! What are you talking about? It screams every time I try to pull it out of the ground. It's a mandrake, Sunny. Leave it alone. They continued on their journey. Sunny, what are you doing up there? Ah, oh, nothing. I'm just looking at the seaweed in the tree and wondering how it got here and why it's grabbing my foot. I think that might be Devil's Snare, Sunny. Why don't you come and walk next to me where I can keep a very close eye on you? Okay. As they walked past the Whomping Willow, the forest became dark and a little more spooky than before. This is when their actual science moment began, for in front of them, in a small clearing, in a dense forest, lay the actual bone of an actual unknown creature. Danielle and Sunny stood pondering what this creature may have been. Danielle wondered if the bone was from a chicken. Hey, maybe that's where your chicken drumstick came from. That's a crazy idea. It's got to be the leg off one of the fish in the creek back there. There were so many things wrong with this idea that Danielle didn't know what to say. For one thing, this bone was nowhere near the creek. Secondly, it didn't look a whole lot like a leg bone. And finally, fish don't usually have legs. After much debating, the pair decided that the bone might be the skull of an animal due to the presence of eye sockets and teeth. With part of the mystery solved, they had only to discover what type of animal it might be from. Sunny was full of ideas. A unicorn? Animals, Sunny. Oh, uh, dinosaur? They're extinct. Why don't we try and think about all the groups of animals that actually live on Earth and have bones, and then we can work out which animal it might be. Good plan. Animals with bones. 
Animals with bones. Hmm. Actually, I can't think of any. Finally, the pair came up with a list of five groups of animals that have bones. Birds, reptiles, mammals, fish, and amphibians. What's an amphibian? It's the group that frogs are in. They live half their life in the water and half on land. They lay eggs and are usually pretty slimy. But they don't have teeth. So, this can't be an amphibian skull. I guess not. Do birds have teeth? I don't know. Just then, Sunny came up with a plan. Maybe if they could get a ruler, they could find out how big it actually was. This thing looks enormous. Its head is even bigger than mine. Do you think I should go get a ruler so we can measure it? Yeah. At this point, the two were stumped. They decided to call on the help of their 430 friends at Whitehorse Primary School. Will Danielle and Sunny be able to discover the identity of this creature before darkness falls? Will their friends at Whitehorse Primary School help them? And what could have happened to their chicken drumstick? Find out in next week's episode of Science in Legoland. So it's time that we talk about the coconut octopus again. I've had lots of comments about this. Some people have asked questions about where the coconuts actually come from. Good question. And I need to kind of mention a couple of things that I saw when I watched the Octonauts episode about the coconut octopus. So my daughter found it for me on the computer because she knew about this already, as I told you. And in that episode, two things happened that are very interesting, but not very real, I don't think. So one of those things is the octopus came out of the water, crept up onto the beach, stole everybody's coconuts, and then ran back into the water. I don't think that's actually how they do it. I don't think octopus usually come out of the water. I know there's a couple of species that can, but I don't think these ones do. I think they find them on the bottom of the ocean. I'm assuming the coconuts have, shells have washed in there from you know nearby islands and palm trees. So that's the first one. Second one, this one's fantastic. If this was true, it'd be so rude. The octopus in Octonauts gets coconut, puts its little tentacle out of the ocean and then like piffs it over its head and it flies off into the distance into an island and then it hits this creature on the head. It's a great moment, <laughs> but I don't think it's actually something octopus can do. I've read all the articles I could find on it about their behavior and all that stuff. But as far as I know, octopus do not throw coconuts at people's heads. So let's just debunk that right now. That's all I have for you today. Uh, there's two things I'd like you to do now, please. The first one is make sure you do the experiment and put your answer up on Google Classroom where I'll set a question about that. And the second thing is, since you've seen Science in Legoland, I would like you please to fill in the sheet that asks about what kind of animal you think this skull could be from. It's a real skull that we found. And you have to give evidence for why you think it could be this creature or not, not that creature. So fill that in and then submit that as an assignment as well. Uh, and one last thing, as we close, I have to show you a picture that James drew of the coconut octopus. You might like it, just like I did. All right, I'll see you next time.